As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. This is the Lent Talk for the 15th of May, 2022, the fifth Sunday in Easter. Our lectionary passages, Acts 11, 1 to 18, where Peter comes to terms with what he calls um, the eating of unclean food and trusting the Spirit in opening up the gates to eat whatever is on your plate, <laughs> whatever God has put on your plate. Or as Peter put it, the Spirit told me to go with them. And when the Spirit tells you to do something, you better do it. Psalm 148, um, the sea monsters from the deep. I love this. You establish them forever. But we got a little conflicting passage here when, when the Revelation 21, 1 to 6, where you have the new heaven and new, new earth, and the sea was no more. Now, sometime I want to do a whole long talk just on what this one phrase means, the sea was no more. Because further on, right here, in our lectionary passages, in the New Jerusalem, it talks about the home of God is among mortals, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That, that's, that, I want to be, include that with the, with the, um, this, the sea is no more. But God is making all things new, um, and writing these words that are true, and the promises to the thirsty, I will give water from the spring of the water of life. But how can you get water when water is no more? Well, th this is why we need to talk about the molten sea, and we will do this in a, in a future one talk. The passage, though, that I want to spend a little bit of time with you, um, and <clears throat> I don't know how many times I've preached on this, I don't think there's ever enough times you can preach on this, is the the John 13 passage, I give you a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. And Jesus repeats this over again. This is a new commandment, a new rule. This is a new protocol for living. You love one another as I have loved you. Now, we, we confuse this kind of love, and I want to talk about it here, this, this love one another. Notice love is a verb. Jesus' form of that verb, agapeo, is a verb. <clears throat> and a verb is an action. So love is not a feeling that you emote and express so much as it is an action that you will, that uh, a deed that you do. That's the real meaning of this, this love here, the agapeo love, the love that God has for uh, the Father has for the Son, the, the love that is shared in the perichoretic unity of the community of the Spirit and the Father and Son existing together, and the kind of love that that God has for us through Jesus. Now, we confuse when we think of love, biblical love. We we got all these rankings of love, and we get them wrong. We think the highest ranking is the golden rule: do unto others or love one another as you would have do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, that is an improvement over the, the silver rule, which is do unto others as they uh, do to you, which is the uh, lex talionis rule, which is a, a, an improvement over do unto others before they do to you, which I call the, the bronze rule. But there is an iron rule here that we forget, which makes the, the lex talionis uh, an even higher improvement on, um, on, on the, uh, the iron rule, which is that if I poked out a price, out, out, out your eye, if I poked out your eye, I could pay the price for that eye and it would be all right. So this is kind of the disfigurement rule. I would have the right to disfigure you. This is the iron rule, really. If 
uh, I could pay for it. So in some ways, this rule ensured that the poor existed uh, for the sake, at the mercy of the rich. Who could pay to harm them? Who could pay to humiliate them and those they didn't like? So the lex talionis, um, or an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, was really an improvement on this, this iron rule. And it was a big move forward in the history of justice. But we go from the iron rule, the bronze rule, the silver rule, the golden rule, to the, the platinum rule, which is a step above the golden rule, which is do unto others as they would have you do to them. This is, this is a culture living in a, in a Burger King theology. Do have it your way. But Jesus says, I'm playing on all your rules because I give you the Jesus rule. I call it the titanium rule. The Jesus commandment, you do unto others, love one another as I have loved you. And the, to the topic for today is how has Jesus loved us? What is the nature of this agapeo love? This love that Jesus is, is talking about here. Now, you often hear, we learned, unfortunately, from New York Life at the Super Bowl last year, not from the church, that there are four words for love. There's Greek words for love. Actually, there's at least eight um, so we need to get something right from the very beginning. There are at least eight Greek words for love. Uh, this is Greek philosophy, eight types of love. Now, some scholars have actually said there's 10. I think that the addition of the two more is a little strange. I'm just going to give you with the, 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 the really unarguable eight Greek words for love. And you know four of them. You know, eros, romantic, passionate love, body love. Philia, affectionate, friendly love uh, for brothers, uh, <clears throat> brothers who are not related because that's storge, unconditional familial love. And then um, here's the ones that you may not know, ludus love. The word ludic uh, means play. Uh, Johann Heisinger wrote this classic book called Homo Ludens, Humans at Play. And um, I made a big deal of this in my book, um, The Well-Played Life, uh, the role of ludic and um, <clears throat> how we're all to be ludic lovers and, and, and disciples. Pragma, committed, long-lasting love. It's pragmatic love that is steadfast love. And then there's the one that we often forget, mania love, which is obsessive love. Uh, mania is the kind of love that a stalker feels towards their victim. And... <clears throat> as a kind of love, mania is not good. Now, the Greeks knew this as a uh, as just as well as we do, but there are some <clears throat> manias that are good and some manias that are bad. Um, mania describes what a jilted lover feels, for example, when they're extremely jealous of a rival or the unhealthy obsession that can result from mental illness. And But there are positive manias and negative manias, so um, it's a little more confusing. But the eighth kind of love, and the highest form of love, is in a word that Jesus uses for love, is a verb form of agape, agapeo. Now, the word's verbal nature means this is a call to action. Um, the verbal quality of love means that love is not just an emotion that you feel and you express, but it's an intent. It's not just a... a Resolution is a resolve that you act on. And the pattern of love, as I have loved you. In other words, we're known by the kind of love that we show that reflects the kind of love that Jesus has shown us. Now, we, we've talked before a little bit about some of the features of this love, like self-sacrificing, self-giving, and Voskamp has a marvelous saying that we're told that love is a verb, but we're never told what that verb is. <laughs> and uh, she, she suggests that that word for love, the verb for love, is give, and to live in a state of givenness. And and I love that. But um, and, and the early Christians were known for this this kind of love. Um, Minius uh, Minucius Felix um, in his classic Octavius, uh, says that um, they know one another by secret marks and signs, and they love one another almost before they know 
one another. He's one of the earliest apologists for Christianity. We don't know anything about his personal history. He, he wrote between 150 and 270, so it's a very early testimony to the early church. But Minucius Felix said, they know one another by secret marks and signs and I love this. They love one another almost before they know one another. Because love is, again, it's not uh, responsive to what somebody does for you. It's an expression of, of will. It's an action of, of the, the intellect and the, and the heart together. It's an intent. Um, and live out of this reality, as I have loved you, as Paul put it, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. In Christ, the new creation is here. Jubilee is here. So we're living out of a, a love paradigm that is very different from the rest of the world. So features of this agape love, it is selfless. It is self-sacrificial. It is self-giving. And there's where Ann Boskamp comes in. Um, but it also, and this is where you... We thank God for Greek scholars who really know the nuances and subtleties of the Greek language. But it also has this, in the context, it has an element, and it's going to stun some of you first, but stay with me, of preference. In other words, in this context, you have all these choices out there. And among all these choices, there is this preference, this choice, this, this chosenness this privileging, if you will, of one that is not at the exclusion of the others, but it's a one to start with and to showcase and to, and to shower and to um, spoil, if you will. So there's this, among all that are out there, I choose you. Among all that are out there, I choose you. You. I choose you. And I'm going to bestow and, and bless you and you. Now, <clears throat> this, is, this is very hard for some of us to get. And this is where it is so easy. And this is the critique of, of some forms of political philosophy. That some people can love everybody in general so much. They love nobody in particular very much. And it's a, it's a tendency in all of us. We, when we talk about humanity in its broad sweep, um, oh, yeah, we have a love for humanity. We have a love for the world, for the planet. When it comes to my neighbor next door, now that's another story. Um, you know what this neighbor did to you know, we could We can always go there. Um, but this agapeo, this verb here, always has an element of... I chose you for a special relationship. And you start with the particular. In other words, you don't start with the universal. You start with the particular. Um, um, and each one of us, I mean, I, I have so many book ideas, and I can't commit myself to all of them. I have to agapeo one of them. I have to. You can't marry all the pretty uh, high school uh, girls that you see. Uh, you, you can't go out with them all. You got to choose one. You got to choose a particular. Um, and agapeo. Yes, it's always universal love. Well, it's the universal love only after it starts with a particular love. Um, and you go from the particular, here's the key, to the universal. But it starts with the particular. And then you go to the universal. I was part of, I wouldn't, didn't even know I was part of this. I was part of a class action lawsuit. Um, and I think there were, what, about like 13 million people in this class action lawsuit. It was a big one. And I, I think there was, I don't know hundreds of millions of dollars in, in a reward damage to these these people, uh, us, the victims. 
And we were promised a check and the check was coming. And so when the check arrived, I got 73 cents. I got 73 cents out of this hundred million, hundred plus million dollar settlement. In other words, the love of the courts was spread so across the board that um, none of us, no, none of the victims got anything of any worth or value. And I was thinking at the time when I got my 73 cent check and whether to even check it, uh, cash it or just save it as a souvenir, uh, how ridiculous this whole thing is young people that make money off of this are the attorneys. But um, I would have been much happier if I would have foregone my 73 cents, if all of the damage awards had gone to one or two people in particular, and the rest of us could have been blessed by the story of what these one or two people that were like us had done and how it had changed their life. 73 cents never changed any of us. And you can't even get a coffee with 73 cents, but to have somebody who had a couple who had the story and the witness of what that money meant and how it changed their life, I would have gladly turned over my 73 cents to get that, that story and that inspiration. Um, God loves in particular first and nature doesn't paint in broad strokes. It paints in minute particularities, which add up to universals, but you look at the, you look at every one of these trees and flowers and grass, and the the more particular the the more microscopic it gets, the more grand and glorious and detailed and beautiful. Oh, it's so easy when we talk about love, agape love, to love everybody in general, so that we love no one in particular. I repeat, the way to the universal is through the particular. The particular, let me put it differently, is of universal significance. And that's with the whole story of the, the Hebrews. Uh, the particular, every particular person carries a universal significance. And the more particularized a person becomes, the more universalized their, their significance. Um, why, I mentioned Ann Boskamp, why does everybody love, why was she a New York Times bestselling author? Why does everybody want to read her? Well, she writes from the standpoint of a Canadian farmer's wife with seven kids. And almost on every page, you get some kind of particular story of what it means to be a farmer's wife in Canada with seven kids. And that, that particularity, has universal significance. Why does everybody love to read Shane Claiborne, who who um, has a community in a simple way that has, what, uh, less than 40 followers? He went and started a new monastic community in, in Kensington, Philadelphia, one of the most dangerous places. Uh, I just preached uh, at Frankfurt, which is right next to Kensington, uh, last weekend. And um, this is not a place to play around in. Um, and he started a community there in the particularity of one of the most dangerous places in Philadelphia and loves that neighborhood, loves that zip code and writes stories that have universal inspiration and application from the particularity of that place, Kensington place in Philadelphia. The resonance, this is the future here, the resonance of an authentic voice because that authentic voice resonates and it resonates universally. Um, and that's why we need, we need that resonance and we need to enter this, this world, this new world now, because it is here now, because I'm a new creation in Christ. All things have become new. And so we live out of this newness. We don't look back to the oldness. We look forward to the, to the newness. I was thinking about the whole story of, of Lot's wife. And uh, it turned into this pillar of salt. Uh, but 
well, let's talk about what what that is an expression for. Now, God could have turned her into a pillar of salt, but salt is also an expression of what was her problem. Her, her problem was she kept looking back. She didn't look into the future that was being led to her and le by the hand, by some angels. She kept looking back at, at what was she had left behind in Sodom and Gomorrah. And as she kept looking back, she couldn't stop crying. And she cried and cried and cried. And by the way, tears, tears, made of two things, water and salt. And she just kept water, salt, water, salt, water, salt, water, salt. And soon she just cried herself to death. She became a pillar of salt because she couldn't receive the new world that she was being ushered into, not just to Zoar, but beyond, into, into this whole new, new story and a new promised land. Um, crying. Um, an expression, I think, of this agape love, um, agapeo, uh, a response of love, Every mother shows when a child is born, their particular child, their, their particular DNA has, has produced. And, and the moment a child is born, what does the mother do? Cry. Uh, the moment the child cries, what does the mother do? Cry. The moment the child laughs, what does the mother do? Cry. The father too. Um, love. This kind of love. This God love. This agape love. This Jesus love. Just opens up our liquid faucets and this overflow of love. But this is a love for the future, not a love looking back, not a crying, a crying for the future, not a crying for what has been left behind. And this is the challenge that Mary Magdalene, and I never saw this before until just recently. Um, she's asked twice, why are you weeping? She's asked once, First, by the angels at the tomb. Why are you weeping? And then she's asked by the one she thinks is the gardener, who's, who's actually her risen Lord, why are you weeping? And the question is immediately um, followed by another question. Who are you looking for? And then there is a double declaration. The angels, he is not here. He is risen. And with the risen Lord, do not cling to me. I am not here in my old state. I'm only here in my new state, and I will not be here long. Because I'm going to do something even greater for you than you ever imagined. And Mary was open to hearing. Uh, he is not here. He is. He is risen. So let's understand the nature of one of the most important polarities to get, the nature between the universal and the particular. The particular you particularize in order to universalize. You don't particularize to stay there. You particularize in order. In other words, the more zip code you become, the more planetary you become in your resonance and in your the more postal code, the more planetary. There are, and when, when we talk about universal, I, I mean universal. I, I can't imagine the, the figures here. There are two trillion galaxies. Just think about this. We know one galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. It's so big I can't even comprehend the Milky Way galaxy. There are two trillion of these galaxies. And each one of these galaxies contains a couple hundred billion stars. I can't even imagine how one galaxy is. We got trillions of them, and each one of them has a, a few hundred billion stars that are a part of them. It is so ridiculous. It's so improbable. It has to be real. Nobody can make this up. But you don't start there. You start there, you get paralysis. You start at the, with a gape of love. The, Love that's a verb. You start there with the, the particular, with what's in front of you. And then, but you don't end there. 
the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the richest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care God gave God's son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned himself. His sin, oh, love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure. Saints and angels. So, then my favorite stanza, I'm going to close with this, this stanza. Could we eat the ocean too? And were the skies of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man is scribed by trade to write the love of God above, drain the ocean wide. Could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky? Oh, love, like a payer of love. Which measureless and strong, it shall forever born. Saints and angels, so I got paid. Love of God, love others as Christ has love thus. That's our new marching orders. The Jesus commandment, the titanium rule, love.